Ohio State, Penn State, Purdue, Buckeyes, Boilermakers, Lions. Oh my, spring football is here. From L.A. to Piscataway, all Big Ten, all year long. This is Big Ten Ten. That's right, some spring practices are coming to a close, which means we're getting an eye on some of these spring games and where exactly teams stand, where exactly certain pieces to these football teams really fit into place. It is a very interesting time of year, and we are on the eve of Christmas. Are you going to be the receiver of gifts or are you going to be giving gifts to others? Yes, the transfer portal is slated to open as well. It may be the middle of April, but there's a whole lot going on within college football and of course our beloved Big Ten Conference as well. In the show tonight, we're going to be wrapping up three, the first three Big Ten spring games and reacting to those. Ohio State, Penn State, and the Purdue Boilermakers over there in West Lafayette, Indiana as well. We'll be kind of recapping what we saw and then how they can carry that and what they need to improve on, things like that, as we approach uh, sp- as we approach fall camp, I should say, as well, coming on down the line. I mentioned it briefly there. Fan bases around college football, fan bases around the Big Ten. Take a deep breath. The next couple of days are going to be fine. It's going to be okay, but the next few days, James Franklin said it, that it is going to be awfully interesting, folks. It is going to be a mad rush. This is the very first transfer portal period with absolutely no rules, no limits. Anything goes almost in this transfer portal period. So just keep that in mind as we progress throughout the next couple of days and the next week as well. So we are going to chat about Ohio State's and Purdue's spring game uh, down a little bit later here on the program. But I really want to start first with the Penn State Nittany Lions. And to, to make that happen, to be able to do that, we welcome in our buddy from the hardcore Penn State football podcast, Mr. Sean Kane, joins us now. And, Sean, it's great to have you on. It's great to be here with you. Let me start first with this. A lot of a couple of days ago, we all heard the news. It was reported that Keandre Lambert-Smith sounded like his intentions were ent- to enter the transfer portal. It looked like he was on the roster that the media gave to everybody at the spring game And then everybody was on the edge of their seat, waited with bated breath, and he didn't run out of the tunnel. So it sounds like he is making his way out of State College. What was your initial thoughts? What was kind of your initial impressions when uh, you heard this news? Immediately, uh, Keandre had some Twitter interactions that um, didn't that didn't make it seem like he was too happy of a camper, but then he had made an announcement with uh, Penn State's NIL Collective, um, Happy Valley United, that he was that implied that he was coming back, and that he was with the team for the majority of the spring. And then in the last week or so, you started hearing from insiders that uh, he might not even be with the, with the team anymore. And then uh, Blue White Illustrated on their podcast, they actually reported that his locker was was cleaned out. So that and that was Friday Thursday or Friday. So at that point I kind of knew all right Keandre Lambert Smith is probably not going to be with this program. Um so I mean he is a great talent but he never quite put it all together. Sure. He had some moments. Uh we all remember the Rose Bowl. He has the longest reception in Rose Bowl history. Uh, the first game against West Virginia, but he's never been a consistent enough player, and it's it's too bad because he's got a, he's got all the talent in the world. Moments. That's that's a good way to, I think to put it. Is you've seen kind of flashes of brilliance here and there, uh, but sometimes it doesn't has it all come. It hasn't really all come together sometimes to get that one thousand yard season or, or whatever to really be that star. And wide receiver has been a position of note. For Penn State, obviously, they grabbed Julian Fleming in the transfer portal, and this is going to really segue into what we saw in the spring game. 
I think we saw a lot of good players. I'm not sure if we saw a standout great player. What was kind of your initial impression of the receiver group in this new look Andy Kotelnicki offense in the spring game? Yeah, I mean, I think you summed it up pretty well. Um, I thought Harrison Wallace had a nice game. Yep. Um, he's the thing with him is when he plays, he, he, he's good. He's a good player. Um, but he's injured quite a bit. Uh, he, I believe now James Franklin doesn't talk about injuries. Um, but it was, but I think it was whispered at least that he broke his collarbone last season, played a little bit in the bowl game. And then I think he tweaked it again. Um, and you know, the problem with him has always been staying in the field. Julian Fleming is a good player. Um, people in the big 10, very familiar with him. But has he ever shown anything that makes me think he's number one receiver? No, not a national championship. Uh, we're, we're trying to be a national championship contender. Uh, he hasn't shown that. He showed that he could be the third or fourth guy on a really, really good receiving core. But I, I don't know if he's a one. So um, Omari Evans is another guy who's very talented. Didn't do a whole lot in the blue-white game. Uh, Kaden Saunders had a couple nice catches. Uh, but, yeah, there's a lot. That, it's not really even – a talent issue per se. Like people kind of talk about our Penn State's receiving core, like it's Air Force quality, right. and it, it, it's not. It's more development, and the development is just not happening with them. Well, I'll say this because I think Penn State is set to kind of open the box. Maybe Mike Yursich in his reign. Everything kind of felt boxed in a little bit. And now with Andy, it feels like it's about to get a lot more creative, dynamic, et cetera. We all know what, what comes with. Just look back at the film at what Kansas had looked like. Illinois fans here in the Big Ten know all about that in that non-conference game last year. And it feels like he's about to open it up. And you look at the depth of this wide receiver room. And like you said, I think there's talent there. I think there's depth there, but maybe just opening up this offense is really going to bring this thing all together. Now, let's look at this offense in this spring game. You know, install, install, install. That is such a key word during this time of year, and we're getting it with this Penn State offense. What was kind of your impression from the offense as a whole from kind of 10,000 feet up in the spring game? Yeah, I mean, there were definitely some clunky moments uh, that I, I don't know. I don't know if you saw it, the very first play of the game, the yep. kickoff, it was fumbled. Yep. And then the first time with the, what's probably going to be the first team offense, fumble on the exchange. So you did see some spring things that weren't ideal. Uh, I thought the run game looked promising. Mm -hmm. uh, keep in mind, uh, Katron Allen has been hurt the whole spring. He's supposed to be all ready to go for summer camp, but he was hurt the whole spring. So he didn't really participate much. Nick Singleton didn't get a carry in the blue white game, although he suited up. So we saw a lot of Quip Martin, uh, a lot of Cam Wallace, a lot of London Montgomery. So I did think the run game looked all right. Uh, offensive line had some good moments, some bad moments, especially in pass pro. But Penn State was also missing uh, Drew Shelton, who's supposed to be old fashioned who's replacement, and Sal Warmley, who's a six year senior, and is going to be in all likelihood the starter at right guard. So some good moments and bad moments. I thought Drew Aller, though, the, now the wind played a big factor, but I thought the one thing I'll say about him is he did look more comfortable. Mm -hmm. He didn't look like, as you said, robotic as he did last year with your It didn't always look like he was feeling himself out there, and I felt like he looked a little more comfortable um, yesterday, although he was not accurate he was completed under 50 percent of his passes although very very windy day right yeah so it, and i did see you know see some uh, some pistol formation which we hadn't really seen um as well in the past as well so some different formational things i think were very interesting throughout this as well now that's the offense one last thing i should say on the offense rb3 right we saw cam wallace on one side we saw quentin martin boy when you look at quentin martin in his high school tape run game catching passes, returning kicks. There's a lot to be excited with there. Of course, he put the ball in the end zone twice uh, during this game. What was kind of your takeaway on this RB3 battle? Because as you said, no Catron Allen or Nick Singleton in this spring game. Yeah, based on what I saw, and keep in mind, grain of salt with the spring game. Oh, oh absolutely. I think everybody <laughs> knows that. Uh, I think that goes almost without saying. Um, however, um, I think Quentin, I think it's Quentin Martin's job to lose. Yeah. And I do think Cam Wallace fits into this offense. I think you're going to see him. But 
you're going to see, a, I think you're going to see quite a bit of Quentin Martin. I think he's going to have a similar role to Trey Potts mm-hmm. last year. And Trey Potts, he, he didn't get, when you look at the stats, it doesn't look like he played a whole lot, but he had some very, very important plays for Penn State last year. And um, so I think he's going to fill into that role. And I mean, 2025. Uh, Penn State has three running backs coming into this 2020 mm-hmm. class, 2025 class right now, committed. So Penn State's going to be fine when Singleton and Catron uh, decide to move on to the NFL, which I think for both of them will be at the end of end of this year. We'd love to have for 25 as well, but that's kind of the impression that I'm getting from from them. Let's head to defense because, man, a- another year, you sub out a defensive coordinator, Manny Diaz, you bring in former – Indiana head coach Tom Allen, and it looks like almost business as usual on defense. They looked really, really good on multiple levels of the unit. I want to first start up front because we heard about Abdul Carter switching from linebacker to defensive line. He approached the coaching staff, Coach Franklin, and Coach Allen said, hey, this is something that I want to pursue. This is something that I want to do. Coach Franklin in the spring said maybe he was on a little bit on the heavier side for a linebacker, so the transition to defensive line made sense in that respect and i see him coming off the edge like a bolt of lightning and uh, i'm sure uh, you guys in nittany nation it gets you excited a little bit for another fantastic defensive line of course danny dennis sutton and others i saw the depth on display in the spring game as well what was your initial impression of of some of the great timing that we saw i think he got a flag once abdul did maybe a little bit too quick but what was your initial impression of seeing 11 coming off the edge yeah, he, he's going to be fine. <laughs> that transition <laughs> is going to be just fine for him. Uh, he was going up against a true freshman. Uh, Got to keep that in mind. But just that quickness. Yeah. It's a lot like what we saw from Chop Robinson last year. And the, th- the thing is, Chop Robinson's about probably about 10 pounds lighter, I would say, than Abdul Carter. Uh, he's, he's slim. Like, Abdul Carter just has a bigger frame, I think, to be able to add more weight. So I think he could even add maybe a little bit more. Sure. And still, and not lose that frame. But man, he, yeah, he's he's gonna he's gonna fly around. And I think that's the main. I, I think that that's a big reason why he moved to end. Um, like when he played linebacker, he was okay. He was okay at pass coverage. But now he could. He doesn't have to sit and process like you do naturally as a linebacker. He could just ball snap, go get the quarterback, and that's gonna be really exciting to see. I kind of I. And one of the great mysteries of Penn State football is what would 2020 be like with Michael Parsons? <laughs> yeah. And you might have saw Mike in a very similar role. Yeah. I mean, we'll never know. Um, but that's that's a great mystery. And I think we're going to see kind of a snapshot of what that could have been like a little bit. I'm not putting Abdul Carter in Mike's category, but you could you could see a little bit of a picture of what that would have looked like if uh, – uh, global pandemic didn't strike. <laughs> now, one big thing. Let's switch to the back end uh, of this defense, the secondary. Uh, losing a lot of guys. Uh, I don't. I don't think there's any doubt. What Penn State has had the last handful of seasons. When you go back to to Joey Porter Jr. When you go back to Jair Brown, and then you look at this past season with Johnny Dixon and Kalen King. They've been some of the best back there uh, in the secondary. So there's a lot to replace, but. I look at the spring game, and I think they played pretty well because this is the thing about spring games is, well, the offense doesn't look great. Oh, but coverage looks really good. You know, those are the, those are those matchups that kind of go hand in hand sometimes, and you saw it on display here. A.J. Harris coming over from Georgia, I thought looked really good in man coverage uh, during this spring game as well in this occasion. Of course, Jalen Kimber coming over from Florida. What was kind of your takeaway from the secondaries and DBs in coverage? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the cornerbacks, I mean, when you have three guys who are all going to get drafted uh, mm-hmm. at, as corners, yeah, that's going to be tough. That's going to be tough to replace. But A.J. Harris, his recruiting comp, actually, according to 24-7 Sports, was Joey Porter Jr. So he's going to fill in that big physical role that uh, Joey Porter Jr. brought to us a couple seasons ago, and then he just had an outstanding season with the Steelers. Yep. Um Jalen uh, Jalen Kimber uh, played a lot of um, played a lot of football in the SCC, and, um, and he's gonna he's gonna obviously be a contributor. I he actually surprised me with how well he played on Saturday. I thought he played very very well. 
Um, Zion Tracy is another guy. Um, true freshman last year, he played a lot in the bowl game. Didn't play all that well, but he was playing against some of the best receivers in in the SEC at Ole Miss. And uh, Kaylin King and Johnny Dixon both opted out, and that really put them in kind of a t- kind of a tough bind. Uh, Cam Miller's another guy who's who's going to play a lot. So yeah, I think I think in the long run they're going to be fine. But I mean, it's it, it's really a strap it and get ready because. West Virginia is the first game on the schedule, and they have to go to Morgantown. That's a that tricky one, to be yeah. A challenge. Yeah, that yeah. is – they're not to be taken lightly. I thought they played – the score would indicate – I thought they played pretty well against Penn State last year. And although I think this is going to be a really, really good defense, I thought last year Penn State might have had the best defense in the country. I thought they were right there with Michigan. Um, and so – but and, you know, the thing, the thing is, Ted, like, there's a difference – between being the top a top three defense in the country and a top ten defense, mm-hmm. in the big difference. And I just wonder, and I hope they're going to be ready for that first test in Morgantown. That's yeah, on the road. That's that's going to be that. That's one, especially after last year, right? It was. I think a lot of people maybe think back to last year and like, hey, coming up, Drew Aller hitting that long touchdown. Yeah. right out of the gate and they kind of look at the final score and you know it was it was a pretty it was two possessions uh maybe maybe three i can't exactly remember the final score but west virginia is a good team west virginia is a good team um over there in the big 12 where 10 teams could win the conference <laughs> uh in all in all realism uh, out there so i gotta get you out of here on this because I, I might talk to a good amount of people from across this conference And we're going to talk about quarterbacks like we did, running backs, defensive backs, defensive ends. But tomorrow's the day where this whole thing's going to get blown up, (laughs) right? You guys already at Penn State have seen it with with KLS. Now, what are you as Penn State fans hoping that you maybe get out of this spring portal period? What holes are you trying to fill through this second free agency period, so to speak, in order to maybe, like you said, get to that 10, 11 win type of level where you can get to a big 10 championship game and maybe make a playoff run. Well, I mean, I, I know we talked about receivers to death here, but I think they need at least right. one yep. or two receivers. I thought, and I talked about this with Corey on our hardcore Penn state football podcast, that I wanted a receiver before I knew Kandre Lambert Smith was going, because when you look at the room, there's talent there, but there's just not a whole lot that I trust. I trust Julian Fleming. I know what I'm going to get out of Julian yep. Fleming. Um, but outside of him, there's just not a whole lot that I could consist that I could say. All right, I know what I got in this guy. So they need at least one receiver, maybe two. Um, I would like to pick up another offensive tackle. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did pick up Nolan Rucci. He's a transfer from Wisconsin. Yep. I would like to pick up maybe one more. I just don't think you ever have enough of those guys. Um, so yeah, that would be, that, that would be my, what, what I think they should really emphasize. They needed, they need a couple corners. They already got that in the previous, in the previous uh, transfer cycle. So I would focus on trying to get one or two receivers and maybe an offensive tackle. Uh, what do you think about linebacker right now? Because Abdul kind of moving Mm -hmm. into the interior right now, you got Kobe King. They've recruited solidly um, at that position. Do you think linebacker could be a position that they could target in the transfer portal? Maybe, maybe. I mean, with linebacker though, I think there's a lot of young talent there. Like a name that your listeners, I know you get people all over the big Ten. name for you guys to know is Tony Rojas. Tony Ross is going to be a really good player Mm -hmm. in Penn State. And I don't just say that for anybody. I'm I'm more of a wait-and-see type of guy. Now he's going to be really good. Um, He he played last year. He burnt his red shirt. uh, Plays very, very fast. Like, plays downhill. Plays well side-to-side. Loved him. Loved him when we were – Penn State was recruiting him. Um, So that's a name to really know. Now, Tom Allen runs a lot of 4-2-5. So he ran it actually in the spring game right. quite a bit. So you're going to see a lot of four two five. Uh, Kobe King, he thought he really improved in 2023 compared to 2022. Um, so yeah, there's there there is talent there, but if, yeah, I mean if they brought in a linebacker, it wouldn't knock a feather out of me either. We appreciate you coming on board. Penn State spring game in the books, blue and white. Tell everybody where they can find you on Twitter and your show. Yeah, we're at Hardcore PSU FB. 
Um, you, you can look us up on YouTube uh, through State Media PSU. Uh, we're on we're Hardcore Penn State Football everywhere you can find podcasts, Apple, Spotify. So, yeah, we are out there. You just have to find us. Um, yeah, and it's the show is hosted by myself and uh, my good friend Corey Lestoki. We were just at the Blue White game yesterday. We had an event. It's pretty cool. We met some some former Penn some Penn State lettermen. So yeah, um, definitely give us a follow. Give us a listen. Thank All you. Right. All right, Sean. Good stuff. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for having me. All right, that is Sean <laughs> Kane like- from the Hard Score Penn State podcast as the Nittany Lions wrap up their spring practice as well. So now it's time to transition from one p school to another but before we do that we had do have a comment from our guy greg flukar from college football's peak around the corner he's talking about jalen kimber will be the glue in penn state secondary big pickup for the nittany lions well those two defensive backs from the sec when you look at uh aj harris and then you look at jalen kimber as well those were two as sean and i were just talking about those were two pickups that were needed when you have the talent that you have had the last two seasons at Penn State, yet you need to go to the portal and you need to be able to replenish that room with veteran talent. And I thought they did a good job with that. And then you mix it in with some of the young talent that you've been able to recruit. Penn State's restructuring is under Tom Allen as opposed to the aggressive defense that is Manny Diaz is a very interesting thing to keep in mind as we kind of go through this offseason as well. Penn State is one of those teams that's teetering. Maybe they can make a run without Michigan on their schedule. Maybe this is a team that can make a solid run towards a championship, or maybe this is a team that could teeter on that three-loss type of category, which could still get them into the playoff. We know with Power 2 teams now, a three-loss Power 2 team, if you can beat, say, two ranked teams, even if you have three losses, that's a team that can still get to the 12-team college football playoff when all is said and done as well. So let's transition from Penn State, one P team to another. Let's chat about the Purdue Boilermakers. When I looked at Purdue's spring game, I thought of one word, improvement, improvement, improvement. I want to emphasize it three times, even though it's one word, because I think that's just how improved I feel that the Boilermakers will be in that the spring game really showed. And the unit that maybe looked the most improved was that Boilermaker offensive line. This was an offensive line that was extremely banged up last season. There were injuries all across this front. And the injuries across the front maybe caused... um, Hudson Card to get a little bit banged up himself. He was running for his life back there in West Lafayette, Indiana. And when you look at Hudson Card, if he is protected, he has one of the very best arms in this conference. He has a ton of arm talent early and often in this spring game. You saw good protection from this offensive line, not only protecting Hudson Card, but some of the other quarterbacks that exist on this Boilermaker roster as well. When I looked at Hudson Card, when he's able to sit back there and throw the football, he makes really good decisions. He's extremely accurate, and he is decisive. That is such a key word in all of this, in being decisive. His decisiveness really comes from this being his second year in this system, knowing this system, knowing where the, where the ball has to go in certain situations, quick decisions with the football. You combine that decisiveness with the improved pass protection and the improved offensive line. They've gone to the transfer portal and done some things as well. They've beefed up, certainly in their size. I really like what I saw out of Purdue's offensive line in this game as well. Let's talk about the running back position uh, for the Boilermakers. So you have Devin Mockaby, who had a really good year during his walk-on freshman season. Last year, had some ball security issues. Tyrone Tracy came in, kind of stole the thunder a little bit, and we didn't see maybe the year for Devin Mockaby last year. Maybe a little bit of a sophomore slump for Devin in the black and gold. 
So then you bring in Reggie Love in the transfer portal. Big Ten fans, we know all about that name and what he's done at Illinois. And the big question coming into this spring game is where are the reps going to be split? Is this Devin's show? Is he RB1? Or is this a 1A and a 1B? I venture to lean towards the latter. I venture to say that this is a 1A and a 1B. Now, Devin did look like the 1A in this Purdue Boilermakers spring game. He did look like the guy that maybe is going to lead more series more often than not. But being able to plug in Reggie Love and what he is able to do makes this Purdue offense even that much more dynamic. I really liked what they were able to do in this game and kind of what I saw. Now, once again, it is a spring game. Not a whole lot of live tackling, so you got to take that into consideration. But I was more looking at it from a depth chart point of view. Okay, who's taking reps and how often with which group? And it looks like it's going to be split uh, from the number one running back point of view as well. You got to look at this from a defensive perspective side of the football as well this defense looked very much improved as well once again it's year two coming together look back at what ryan walters and now current purdue defensive coordinator kevin kane were able to do in year number two at illinois huge jump gigantic jump from year number one to year number two when they were in champagne they were one of the top defenses in college football it was that performance by the Illini on defense that got Ryan Walter hired as the head coach of Purdue and thus Kevin Kane as the defensive coordinator uh, there as well. Being able to really lean in to this whole year two and getting to know these systems a little bit more, you're seeing that on display in these spring games as well, the familiarity that's maybe going on as well. There are some pieces to this Boilermaker defense that Purdue fans should be pretty excited about as well. As it pertains to the Boilermakers, I want to end on this. The cradle of quarterbacks is not going to stop, it looks like, after Hudson Card. Marcos Davila, aside from maybe that pick six, (laughs) aside from that pick six towards the end of this one, he was accurate and he was calm, cool, and collected. This kid's a high schooler. Okay, he's an early enrollee, and I was very impressed in how he was patient, okay? And as decisive as he was, we mentioned that word with the veteran, Hudson Card, but Marcos Davila is next for Purdue at the quarterback position. Boilermakers should be very excited about what's to come at the quarterback position. They recruited really well. I thought this past recruiting class overall for Ryan Walters was very very good. I believe it was top 30 to top 35 in all of college football. Considering it's your first really full class, that's pretty impressive for a young coach like Ryan Walters. Let's move to Columbus, Ohio and talk about the Buckeyes. A lot to talk about as it pertains to Ohio State's spring game, the very first spring game broadcast nationally on Fox. Now, When you look at spring games, a lot of times you see one side of the ball look really, really good. And then you see the other side of the ball maybe not look as good. You saw that kind of matchup disparity happen early in this spring game when this Ohio State defense, this defensive line, was playing on the other side of the line of scrimmage against an Buckeye offensive line that we know needs some help. And we saw exactly the amount of help that it needed when we watched them in that bowl game, the Cotton Bowl against Missouri uh, last season as well. Now, when you look at the defense, that's where I really want to focus on. The secondary on defense is extremely deep. No Lathan Ransom out there on Saturday for the Buckeyes, and they still had not one, not two, not three, but four interceptions against this Ohio State offense. I was impressed with how stuck they were like glue to some of these wide receivers, some of these really good wide receivers uh, as well, and quarterbacks that we've heard a lot from during spring ball uh, as well in Columbus, Ohio. So it just goes to show what Jim Knowles 
is truly building in Columbus, Ohio. It just goes to show the steps that they are taking as a program on defense. This is going to be one of the best defenses in college football this year, if not the best defense in college football. I believe it's that good. I believe it's that deep. It's going to be a whole lot of fun to watch this team on the defensive side of the football. Now, when you talk about Ohio State, you have to talk about the offensive side of the ball. You have to talk about maybe the most talked about quarterback battle in all of college football. You got to talk about Will Howard, and you got to talk about Devin Brown, and you got to talk about Julian Sane, and you got to talk about Lincoln Keenholz, and you got to talk about Aaron Nolan. There's five of them in there. An extremely talented quarterback room that exists in Columbus, Ohio. Here are the takeaways I took at the quarterback position from this Ohio State spring game. The veterans are leading the charge. Will Howard and Devin Brown. And I believe that's the way you want it with such high pressure and expectations that exist in Columbus, Ohio. I know Julian Sayan has been getting a lot of hype. I know he's been getting a lot of press from what he's been able to show in spring practice. But in a almost a national championship or bust type of season, these true freshmen are going to be very talented one day. I just think you want a veteran leading the charge. And that the spring game really showed that. The freshmen, I think, still have a ways to go. They still have some things to develop on. Although they did look really good. I thought Julian Sane responded after throwing that interception pretty well. But this is, seems like it's going to come down to Will Howard and Devin Brown. I think Devin Brown is pushing Will Howard right now. Will seems to be the leader in the clubhouse. He seems to fit what Chip Kelly wants to do. He seems to fit around him how run-centric that this offense wants to be in 2024 as well. But then again, when I watch Devin Brown, who's been banged up, right? We haven't really seen a truly healthy Devin Brown. Remember last spring, he got hurt. And then, of course, what happened in the Cotton Bowl against Missouri as well. All of those factors kind of led to him not being the guy last year in Columbus, Ohio. Now he's fully healthy. Now he's getting his chance to compete for this quarterback job. I think he's going to push him. I think we could see maybe Will Howard go to week one of the season, maybe week two of the season, where this thing isn't decided yet. But it seems like Will Howard is the guy. It seems like Will Howard is efficient enough, he is good enough, and has established enough of a relationship with some of these wide receivers and some of these other parts and coaches around this Ohio State offense that he is going to be the guy. Like, when I look at Will and what he brings to the table, right? He came out 11 personnel, 10 personnel. You split out four wide receivers. And it's classic Chip Kelly football, man. It's classic, like it was at Oregon, right? You spread everybody out. You have the threat that is the pass game, and it's power run. It's spread run game. And you've got two of the very best backs in college football in the backfield. I remember it very specifically. They spread them out four wide, and they took advantage of the matchups in the box. I feel like that's going to be Buckeye football in 2024. And then that transitions into this running back room as well. That was something that people were talking about. I was kind of talking about it. What were we going to see in the spring game? I don't know if Trevion Henderson or Quinshawn Judkins by themselves is going to rush for 1,000 yards. I mean, they very well could, but the way it seems right now is this is split. They want to keep both of those guys fresh right now, both of them taking a, a good amount, a healthy and equal amount of some good reps in the spring game as well. And they're both extremely talented. Now, they did talk on the spring game about possibly getting them on the field at the same time. I believe that's going to be more of a wrinkle and maybe more of a rarity more than anything. You're going to put both of these guys on the field to kind of mix things up 
when it comes to the defense kind of looking at, at what you're doing. I could very well see someone like Quidshawn lining up in the slot. You have Trevion to the left or the right of the quarterback as well, getting them on the field at the same time that way and some design screens or short passing to get some of those receivers out in a different area of the football field, get it to them out on the perimeter a little bit quicker so they can catch and go, and you get an easy six, seven, eight yards and keep moving the chains for a first down. But it seems like you're going to see a lot of both of them, and that was to be expected. That's what I was anticipating. You weren't going to bring in Quinshawn Judkins okay, to be a clear number two. Okay, when you have Trevion Henderson fully healthy, he's one of the best backs in all of college football. So everything seems to fit, and this is an Ohio State run game that could be one of the very, very, one more time, very best in all of college football. I want to wrap up with one thing as it pertains to Ohio State. I want to wrap up on the broadcast from Fox. We've seen spring games before. On Big Ten Network, they've broadcasted a whole bunch of them over the years. But this one was a little bit different in how they approached it. I love being able to have Joel Klatt ask Ryan Day different situational questions, different questions as it pertains, especially just some of the younger guys, especially as it pertains to this quarterback room as well. I think there was one time they were in the red zone. They were doing an RPO. He says, hey, I would have passed it, but they ran it in for a touchdown. All right, I'll take it. It kind of gives you a little bit of insight into the program as well. Obviously, you're not going to get this during the season. So being able to, as fans, being able to have that type of insight and that type of maybe behind the scenes type of looks, coaches mic'd up, so you can kind of see the discussions with quarterbacks and other position groups. Being able to see that, I think, is a very cool insight. And kudos to everybody at Fox for making that happen. Ohio State, okay, this might be a team that is, they're still going to be very explosive. They're still going to be a very good football team, but it's going to look a lot different in Columbus, Ohio. You started to see it a little bit last year where you saw maybe Kyle McCord wasn't slinging it around as much as Justin Fields and as much as C.J. Stroud. Maybe you didn't get as many home run balls as you saw in the past. You're going to defend Ohio State a little bit different next season but this is still going to be a really, really good football team. Really good football team, I think, coming in at Ohio State University. We've got more from our guy Greg over at College Football's Peak Around the Corner. Here's an interesting question that he possesses, and I got a good feeling about this, but I might provide a couple of different insights on this. Greg asks, Ohio State versus blank in the Big Ten championship game. Dramatic sip of water. Right now, April 14th, <laughs> 2024, we've got a, a little less than five months to go before we kick this thing off. Minnesota taking on North Carolina in Minneapolis. No, is there? Yeah, it's in Minneapolis this year. It's in Minneapolis on that Thursday night to kick things off. Right now, my gut favors Oregon. Okay, that October 12th meeting between the Ohio State Buckeyes and the Oregon Ducks is going to be one of, if not the most anticipated game of the 2024 college football season. This is a little bit of a glimpse into another side of college football. I'm happy that this game is going to be a part of some of the newer, the newer TV partners as well, okay, because it was released, announced, however you want to look at it, Fox will not carry West Coast Big Ten home games in Big Noon. Nobody on the West Coast wants to kick off at 9 in the morning, all right? Let's just, let's just, uh, good decision, right? Overall, that's exactly how it should be. So you're going to either, either see this game on CBS or NBC, My heart of hearts, because it's in Eugene, my heart of hearts is hoping that we see it in prime time on NBC under the lights at Austin Stadium. I think that would be a tremendous 
atmosphere uh, for college football as well. Right now, I favor the Bucks and Ducks in a rematch, but <laughs> I can give you some underdogs. I can give you some maybe teams that could compete for that spot. We just had Sean Kane, hardcore Penn State football podcast. Penn State, they need to get a lot right. And a lot needs to happen for the Nittany Lions to get into that spot. They need to get their pass game right. They need their run game to be like it was a couple of years ago. They need their defense to continue the foundation that it's been laid in the past. Penn State does not play Michigan this season, but you're going to get that over the next couple of years. Well, hey, we don't play Michigan. Oh, but you do play Southern Cal that has a pretty darn good offense and could have one of the most improved defenses in all of college football, right? That's kind of the trade-off that you get. Well, we don't have to play so-and-so. We don't have to play Ohio State. Oh, you got to play Oregon, and they might be just as good if not better. Right. It's a whole different type of football, a whole different type of football that's kind of coming in, which could add another element to making it maybe difficult to defend uh, the Oregons and the USC's and some of those high powered West Coast offenses uh, as well. So I'll throw Penn State in Michigan. I want to throw in there as well. And we might find out if Michigan is a realistic contender in the next few days, if they can go to the portal and grab a really good transfer quarterback, this is a team that has a foundation that maybe with a quarterback and some other transfer pieces, this is a team that has a foundation to make it back to a Big Ten championship game. Now, when we look at Michigan, check the box that is the defensive line. Mason Graham might be the best defensive lineman in college football next season. Okay, you look at Derek Moore on that line uh, as well. Kenneth Grant uh, is coming back. Like, that's a really good D-line. Linebacker group, Jay Sean Barham is a bigger transfer than people are giving it credit for. I think I saw PFF, linebacker-wise, had him in the top 10, which I thought was, was good. Right, he's gonna. I feel like he's gonna take the next step up in his career um, at Michigan, coming over from the Maryland Terrapins. And that secondary, even the loss of Rod Moore at safety, this is still a really, really good secondary. Makari Page is there, of course, one of the best corners in the country. And Will Johnson is back there in that secondary. But here's the deal, folks: if you're trotting out Alex Orgy, okay who's run the ball, I think he's maybe thrown it one time in his college foot career. You go back to his high school numbers, and he was in the 50s in his completion percentage. So this is an athlete back there. Not saying that that can't win you some games, because it can't. But if you expect to win 10 games, 11 games, if you expect to maybe make that jump to get into – a play a high playoff spot, a Big Ten championship spot, like we're talking about, make a run towards a national title. You're gonna need an upgrade at quarterback. Maybe Alex Orgy could be really good, but we just haven't seen it yet. What we've seen him is as the athlete at quarterback is really what Alex Orgy brings to the table. And then when you look around at this offense, you see some pieces. You see Donovan Edwards there. You see one of the best tight ends in the game. And Colston Loveland, you see him in there as well. They've got okay talent coming back at receiver with Samaj Morgan and Tyler Moore. Certainly some pieces that they can build upon as well. Penn State in there. Michigan in there. I'm going to... I really need to say this is a big if. This is a big if. If, but USC, USC, I, I got I got to say it for my guy, the Trojan Blade. And I know this is a huge wild card. Everything's got to come together. Because here's, I think, the thing that we need to understand 
with the USC Trojans. Okay, number one, their defense will improve. For people looking at the USC Trojans and looking at it like they looked at it last year's defense, which was coordinated by Alex Grinch, who is now coaching safeties at Wisconsin. You cannot compare the two because you bring in a defensive coordinator in Danton Lynn, who was the defensive coordinator last year at UCLA. One of the best defenses, top 10, top 15 type of defense in college football last season. And you look at what he was able to turn around and how quickly he was able to turn it around in one year. This went from a triple digits defense at UCLA and they, he turned it into a top 10 defense in one year. And this defense was focused around the defensive line, the front, Liatu Latu and others up front were able to create a lot of pressure and make it very difficult to run the football on this UCLA defense. Bear Alexander is coming back. Isaiah Rakus comes over from Texas A&M. And you've got Aaron Henderson, the defensive line coach, who was at the LA Rams for the last handful of seasons. Matt Entz coming over to coach your linebackers. This is a team that I in USC that I believe is going to be much improved on the defensive side of the football. USC is a big wild card. Everything needs to absolutely click. For them this season, they need to make that UCLA type of jump on the defensive side of the football. Miller Moss needs to be that next Lincoln Riley quarterback. There's a lot of ifs and there's a lot of boxes that need to be checked. But maybe, just maybe, USC could possibly creep in there if everything breaks their way as well. Remember, Lincoln Riley has made it to two college football playoffs. So if he can get that defense right, this could be a team. And everything could change in the spring transfer portal. They've proven USC another reason. I think why I maybe sneak them into the very bottom of this category is their NIL is in full gear right now. Their name, image, and likeness is is hitting on all cylinders right now. So you got to believe in them as that a little bit. So great question. Great question there uh, by Greg in the chat. All right, let's go to my last topic. My last topic here tonight that I want to talk about pertains to, we go from on the field and we go to off the field for our next topic. And that talks about the wonderful wide world of conference realignment. It's an ongoing thing, whether you like it, or whether you don't, it's going to keep on going around and around and around and around. Now, I know we've got this advisory committee between the Big Ten and the SEC right now, but maybe there it goes a little bit deeper than that if maybe some schools could possibly jump from one to the other. And I want to talk about Texas A&M. Hate is a strong word. It is. You close your eyes and you think of the word hate. And what do you think of? Do you hate something? What do you think of? Does someone hate something else? What do you think of? You think of some pretty strong feelings when you think of hate. I feel that Texas A&M is pretty darn close to that when you talk about their relationship with Texas. Listen to the Texas A&M fight song, and that should show you everything you need to know about the relationship between Texas A&M and the Texas Longhorns as well. That hate, that hate is why Texas A&M left the Big 12 when they did. They wanted to separate from Texas and the stranglehold politically that they had on that league at that point in time. That's why that they are current members of the SEC, and that's why that they did not go with Texas and a whole bunch of schools, maybe out west, to join the Pac-12 in the late 2000s and the early 2010s as well. But In a recent edition of that SEC podcast, ESPN's Paul Feinbaum entered maybe a little bit of 
motivation for yet another conference change now that Texas is in the SEC. They were promised. And uh, Texas would never come in. But things change. Yeah. And, and, and it's A&M's fault. A&M was so successful in the SEC, Cousin Shane, that uh, Texas said, we want some of that. I mean, it really, yeah. it, it, I mean, they, Texas in 2010 was heading to the Pac-12. I mean, they had already commandeered uh, a bunch of schools because they wanted to be more aligned with the Pac-12 academics, uh, the Stanfords, mm -hmm. the Cal's, yeah. right. <laughs> what's now in the ACC. <laughs> uh, and they finally realized we, we need to do something. And Texas could have gone to the Big Ten, ACC. I mean, all this nonsense that we heard from, oh, well, the SEC. The SEC didn't do anything but answer a phone call uh, from yeah. their their attorneys answered a phone call, the same phone call that uh, that everybody else got. They were they were on the prowl. They were leaving them, and they were going to go somewhere. We've all seen a true crime show, whether it be the older classic murder mysteries or Criminal Minds or CSI or the hundreds and hundreds, it seems, of true crime documentaries on Netflix and Peacock. We've all seen them. What's one word and one thing that the interviewees tend to talk about fairly early within a crime case. Motive. Motive. What was the motive for this to happen? Now, there has been some talk tossed around about, hey, could Texas A&M, if they wanted more money or if they wanted this, could they move to the Big Ten? But nothing substantial. And then I see this clip came out about maybe a promise that was made to Texas A&M that Texas would never join the conference. And that could possibly be a motive for AM to make a move in the future. Of course, the only move out of the SEC that the Texas AM Aggies would make is, of course, to our beloved Big Ten. Now, you got to come at this thing from multiple angles. You got to talk about multiple things when you talk about a potential. Texas A&M move in the Big Ten. And I know it is a extreme long shot, but I think it's worth discussing. Let's, let's start first from the Big Ten point of view. Getting this Texas A&M program would check a lot of boxes to what the Big Ten historically looks for in a conference realignment candidate. Let's start first with the first word in their university's name, Texas. Be having a school in the state of Texas in the Big Ten would do a lot. Now, I know markets is not as big of a deal anymore. We want eyeballs, we want big brands, and we want big matchups, right? It's not so much about cable boxes like it was when Rutgers and Maryland uh, were added to this conference, but I think it's safe to say having a Big Ten presence in Texas would draw eyeballs around to the entire state as well. And Texas A&M. Right, that is a big time fan base. That is a very passionate fan base that cares about their eggies. You might think the yell leaders are a little bit weird. You might think the war him is a little bit weird, but there's you can say that until you're blue in the face. But I think there's one thing that you need to say is this is a extremely passionate fan base that cares about their team. And of course, that's there's a lot of other Big Ten teams. It's almost like having another Nebraska. I'm sure everybody would love to have another Nebraska, right? Some people may take that seriously. Some people may think that's sarcasm. But I digress and I move on. Academically and research-wise, right? That's a big deal to the Big Ten Conference as well. Look at the four additions. Really outside of Oregon, Washington, USC, and UCLA are very strong academically and on the research front as well. Texas A&M is a big research university. Texas A&M is a member of AAU, right? It seems like every time we talk about Big Ten expansion, those are the three letters that we bring up as well. So you check that box on the academic and research front as well from the Big Ten perspective. They're a solid football program. I think they would add depth to this conference uh, as well. And of course, they have Big Ten roots in their athletic director's office with former Nebraska AD Trev Alberts in there as well. Now you also have to look at it from the Texas A&M point of view as well. 
and what could be some positives for them coming over to the Big Ten Conference. Number one, do they feel like they're one overshadowed by Texas? And number two, do they feel like that they are a more regional program in a regional conference? Now, the SEC has expanded, right, their regional footprint, right? They've expanded west to Texas. Uh, they've gone up to Missouri, right? You know, in the 90s, they went out to South Carolina. So from their original 10, they have expanded. But it is still a very southern, regional type of conference as well that exists with the SEC, where Texas A&M currently resides right now. If Texas A&M wanted to be more of a national brand, right, if they wanted to step outside again from the shadow that is Texas, right, being now that Texas would be the premier brand, SEC brand within the state, now that that's the case, they might want to step out of their shadow again and become more national. Doesn't become more national than the Big Ten when you got the State University of New Jersey on one side of your league and you're bordering the Pacific Ocean on the other side of your league. <laughs> That's about as national as it gets. Texas A&M, right, instead of playing everybody east to them now, would play USC. They'd play Oregon. They'd play Washington. They'd play Ohio State. They'd play Penn State. They'd play Maryland. They'd play teams from all across the United States, and maybe that would assist them in becoming more of a national brand as compared to their in-state foe, that is Texas as well. And you also have to mention the slight monetary gain. Is that enough for them to make the move? Remember, these boosters paid tens of millions of dollars to get rid of Jimbo Fisher. Okay, if their buyout in their SEC deal, I've heard it might be around $40 million, $50 million dollars. If that is the case, and it could be a lot more than that, but if that is the case, money ain't nothing to these Aggie boosters. Money ain't nothing. And money being nothing might provide them an opportunity. It might be the reason why they might end up staying in the SEC as well because of the – I mean, there is a difference. I think the Big Ten is supposed to be – have a little bit of an edge when it comes to revenue, but it's not overly significant, like it, the gap between the Big 12 and the SEC uh, per se as well. You have to look at it in a semblance of reality as well. And reality kind of coincides with what maybe this guy wants. Now, the reality of the situation is that Texas A&M, who they are, what their brand is, what their identity is, they fit in extremely well to the SEC. When I look at Texas A&M right now, I say that's an SEC school. I think rivalries are a big part of the drawing power from a television standpoint. And when you look at Texas being added to the conference and having this decade plus where they've been a part and now they're coming together with Texas and Texas A&M back as a rivalry, that pays for itself. Texas A&M has rivalries against Texas. They've got rivalries against LSU. They've got rivalries against Arkansas. I feel like bringing rivalries together is one thing that the SEC has done really well. The SEC has focused on expanding their regionality the Big Ten has focused on expanding nationally. Like if Texas A&M were to leave the SEC, or if they had the motivation, they wanted to get outside of Texas as a shadow, they wanted to play a more national conference, etc. Right? They wanted to do all of that. You're leaving behind rivalry games against LSU, against Alabama, against Texas, against Arkansas. Regional rivals that your fan base gets really hyped up for. And now who are you playing of any, you're playing USC, Oregon, Ohio State, Nebraska. Like Nebraska is the closest thing to a rivalry that Texas A&M would have going into this thing. Now I know that is not the be all and the end all of these type of decisions. I'm sure it's not even close to the be all and the end all. But, but... 
you know, this could be something that maybe, you know, I, I'll say it like this. I'll say it like this. I would like to see Texas A&M stay put. The reality of the situation is that that is most likely going to happen. The reality of the situation is, is that that keeps rivalries together. Let's look at it from a Big Ten standpoint. Let's look at it from a Big Ten standpoint. Bringing in Texas A&M gets you a little bit. It adds a lot more travel to your conference as well. I would like to see, from a Big Ten standpoint, I would like to see them bring together other rivalries. Of course, Notre Dame is is out there. We all know what Notre Dame is. Michigan, Michigan State, Purdue, USC, right? That's always been, no pun intended, that's always been the gold mine in terms of Big Ten expansion. But then you look at the West Coast, right? I would almost rather see us bring back the West Coast together of something like a Stanford, of something like a California. You look at the Big Ten as a whole right now, and you got Oregon, you got USC, you've got Michigan, you've got Penn State, you've got Ohio State. That's a pretty darn good first tier right there. Texas A&M doesn't jump into that first tier. So I think you got to be very strategic and try to I would I would this is just me as a fan. I would just like to see rivalries renewed within conference realignment and come back. I know Stanford and Cal will not be added during the television contract. It would have to be during the renegotiation. Like if we see some southeastern teams, if we see some teams in that segment of the country, Miami's been rumored, Florida State's been rumored, Clemson, etc., North Carolina, etc. have been rumored, I would like to see a cluster of them come together so we retain some of these rivalries and we just don't have teams out on islands. Like Texas A&M would be out on an island and they fit much better geographically. They fit much better culturally within this as well. So although it's fun to talk about, although it's fun to see conjecture I view Texas A&M possibly jumping to the Big Ten a little bit. Uh, the narrative might be running away from Texas. I think they just fit so much better within the SEC than they do within the Big Ten Conference. So that's what I'll say on that front as it pertains to the Aggies as well. Three spring games. Three spring games in the books, folks. Three down. We got a lot more to go next week, and we got Michigan. I think we got USC next weekend as well. We'll have coverage of those spring games here on the channel. But until then, thanks everybody for coming by the channel. Thanks everybody for talking Big Ten football here on this night. Until next time, I'm Big Ten Ted. We will see you in the next one.